The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. This is Emily Mooney at OCASI with the Maximizing Governance Project. Very pleased to offer this webinar today, um, facilitated by Graham Boyce from Management Advisory Service. He's going to be talking to you about the um, legal roles and responsibilities of board members for not-for-profit corporations in Ontario. Um, welcome, Graham, and thank you for joining us today. Good morning. This is the second of a series on uh, governance. And today the focus, as Emily said, is on legal roles and responsibilities. And that's an excellent place to start because when you get asked to do something new, maybe play a game that you've never played before, the first question you always ask is, well, what are the rules? Second question is, how do we win? But the first question is always, what are the rules? So it's appropriate to start by looking at that and looking at how the law governs governance. And that's what we're going to do today. I would remind you all of a particular legal maxim that applies. Ignorance is no defense. You have to know this stuff. So the focus today is to go through and look at the legal environment about um, and make sure that there's a common understanding amongst all participants around some of the terms terminology that gets used look at the difference between not-for-profits and charities, and touch on some definitions that I think are important. Then I'm going to look at the board's role in a collective sense. What are the general responsibilities that you have and how do, how do the rules apply in that context? And then I want to look at the individual director's responsibility. And lastly, some challenges that I see from my experience that are very common amongst uh, boards when it comes to governance issues. So let's start at the beginning. What is a not-for-profit? There's a classic definition on the Canada Revenue Agency site, the CRA. I'll use those initials a lot. It's an organization organized and operated exclusively for social welfare. You can see the definition on the screen. I like to use the term not-for-profit, not non-profit, not non because uh, many people don't understand a not-for-profit can actually make a profit. If you walk into a hospital, you see a gift shop. Believe me, the gift shop is endeavoring to make a profit. And from that, it will fund the other activities. So you can run a business, you can make a profit. It simply depends upon who is running the business and for what purpose. Lots of le different legal structures. You can be unincorporated, incorporated, and so on. But I suspect the majority of people, certainly the majority of people listening today, are incorporated. What's all that about? Incorporation is the process of establishing a separate legal entity, um, apart from the members. And you do it for two reasons, and two very good reasons. One, it provides legal protection because it is now the corporation that is taking action, the corporation that is responsible and not the individual members. And secondly, it makes it a lot easier when it comes to signing contracts. If you want to lease office space or buy equipment or, or pay rent or open bank accounts and so on, because there is this legal entity the corporation that does those things, and it continues on, uh, whereas the membership may change, I won't say daily, but not infrequently. When it comes to incorporation, there are two ways you can do this, or two environments in which you can do it. The first is under the federal legislation, the Canada Not-for-Profit Corporations Act, the CNCA. And secondly, you can do it under provincial legislation. And given, I suspect, we're all in Ontario, that would be the Corporations Act, the Ontario Corporations Act. What's the difference between the two? Well, the CNCA is a piece of modern legislation designed specifically to deal with not-for-profit corporations. 
the Ontario Corporations Act, alas, is a rather old act aimed at businesses which has been adapted, to use a polite term, uh, for use with not-for-profits. When I talk about adaptation, let me give you an example. Part three corporations are not-for-profits, corporations without shareholders. Try reading this section and making sense of it. We could spend the next hour talking about which sections, which subsections, which clauses apply and going through the act and changing all the words. It's convoluted and not easy. So, the Ontario Corporations Act, we can say, is dated and adapted legislation. There are other differences between the two. The CNCA, you have a single regulator. With the Corporations Act in Ontario, you have two because you have to involve, very often, the public guardian and trustee as well. You have electronic filing as opposed to paper filing. You have a larger audit exemption under the CNCA. You're not allowed ex officio directors. Those are directors who are on the board because they hold a particular position. A very common example would be past chair. And yet that's not a good thing uh, to have ex officio directors on. Modern governance would say, don't have such positions on. And you see that reflected in the CNCA. Consider for a moment, you have a past chairman who was effectively voted out by the membership, was not re-elected as director because they weren't happy with how that person had performed. And yet they're still on the board because they're ex officio there as past chair. So this is not seen as a good practice. So don't think of that as a positive for the Corporations Act. The CNCA is also very stable. It's an established piece of legislation uh, there have been court cases interpreting it, uh, and the regulations are well known. Unfortunately, with the Corporations Act, it's constantly subject to tickering. Okay? Not only that, many of you may have heard of a thing called ONCA, the Ontario Not-for-Profit Corporations Act. This is a piece of legislation which has been on the books, but never read into law, never become a f enacted. Uh, not, uh, it, it's, it's never uh, been in force, to use the right term. When it will ever come, nobody knows. The current government uh, has suggested it might be here by the end of 2020, but I suspect it's not at the top of their agenda. And if you try to modify your own internal rules and regulations to comply with that Act, you'd find it difficult because there are no regulations published. And while the Act may say you must give notice, it isn't until you read the regulations, which don't exist, that you know you have to give notice within 21 days or 14 days or whatever the number is. And so you have the CNCA, a piece of stable and known legislation, Whereas the OCA is uh, certain, uh, subject to, shall we say, uncertain replacement. We don't know when and we don't know quite what it's going to look like when and if it does happen. So the conventional thinking amongst, I think, the legal community right now is that if you are incorporating or if you're uh, changing your, your uh, own internal documents, um, bylaws or articles or things like that, then take the opportunity to think about moving under the federal legislation. Now, it's important to know that if you're under the federal legislation, you can operate solely in Ontario, just as if you're under the Ontario uh, legislation, you can operate anywhere in Canada. So there's no restriction on where you go. When you've incorporated, you're gonna find you get one of three documents uh, that evidences, and somewhere in your corporate filing system, you should be able to find one of these three types of uh, document. And attached to it at the back are the articles. And the articles are very important because the articles, more than anything else, set out 
the business that you're in, the purposes, the objects of the corporation. So make sure you can locate your articles. Graham, we have a question. Um, where would it say in the articles if an organization is incorporated under the CNCA or OCA? It won't as uh, it would typically uh, be on the very form in front of it, uh, because the front form in front of it will either have been issued by the feds or it have been issued by Ontario. Thank you. Charities are a subset of not-for-profits, and we need to know just how they fit in the system, because I've been talking about not-for-profits. So we have a not-for-profit defined, as we've seen, as operated for a certain set of purposes, but a charity, a charity is different. A charity is a particular type of not-for-profit, operated exclusively for charitable purposes. And there are four heads under which uh, an organization may begin registered charity status. The first of those is that it is focused on the relief of poverty. The second, the advancement of religion. The third one, uh, sorry, the advancement of education. The third one, I'm getting ahead of myself, the advancement of religion. But the fourth one is this wonderful catch-all category, certain other purposes that benefit the community. Well, what does that mean? To interpret that and to help you, the CRA have published a set of model purposes, and you can look it up on their website. There are a variety of things which are seen to be charitable. I've produced some of their model purposes here. You don't have to have the wording exactly the same, but it's clear that if you run a community center or if you run a seniors program, uh, things like that, you'll easily qualify as a charity. But recognize that just because you think that what you're doing is helpful, it's certainly intended to be helpful, and because uh, you think it sounds charitable or should be charitable, doesn't necessarily make it so. Here's an example. If you see the first paragraph here, the objects of this society were to provide educational forums, classes, workshops, and seminars to immigrant women so that they could find employment. That sounds an excellent idea, but, the, but it's not charitable. The court said this is not charity work. Why? Because immigrants are not a defined class of people worthy of help in the eyes of the law. Let's face it. If you're a business person coming over from Europe, or you're someone uh, trying to exit uh, some Asian country with large amounts of money, you don't necessarily need help. Indeed, are you worthy of charitable support? You're more than capable of looking after yourself or paying for, for help. So the fact that they are immigrants does not make them charitable targets. Poverty, the poor, a different issue. So again, when it comes to is this charitable or is this not, it's up to the CRA and ultimately up to the court to interpret uh, whether a particular activity or purpose is charitable. Now, why become a charity in the first place? And I think a lot of people get this wrong. Most people think, oh, we want to become a charity because then we can hand out uh, tax receipts uh, to individuals and we'll get more donors. But ask yourself, is that where our money comes from? Does, in fact, the bulk of our money come from the city, for example, in the forms of grants or payments or transfer payments or whatever else? Do we get a lot of corporate sponsorship? Companies don't want uh, tax receipts. They just want the goodwill that's associated with giving money or support being seen to support a charity? Do you actually make applications to granting foundations? If you don't, then I really question why you would want to become a charity. Yes, it's a valid argument to say, well, we get greater credibility in, in the world outside because we're a registered charity and it's understood that we're better regulated. And that's a fair comment. 
for both the ability to hand out tax receipts and to have greater credibility come at an added cost. And that cost is reflected in three things. Much more demanding bookkeeping. You have to be really on top of your bookkeeping when it comes to things like donation receipts. There's more reporting. You may be required to send audited financial statements uh, to the ministry. And you have um, a small but not insignificant issue. You have to spend money. Charities are not allowed to just sit there and accumulate money. They're required to actually spend it on their charitable activities. And while it's a small amount of the sort of 3% type, type range, there is a formula. Again, it's a complex formula. You can look it up if you're interested. But be aware, you can't just sit on the money, so to speak. So what we have are really four different legal environments. You can be under the CNCA and be simply a not-for-profit, or under the CNCA and be a charity, or you can be under the Corporations Act and simply be a not-for-profit, or you can be under the Corporations Act and be a charity. So we have these four environments. Let it be said, being a not-for-profit under the CNCA, it's a lot easier than being under the Corporations Act and a charity because the law is easier, it's simpler to access, it's easier to understand, it's more straightforward. But you should know which of these four environments you fall under. Some definitions. Board of Directors. Here's a simple definition. But in a lot of instances, people don't describe themselves as being a board. Oh, we're a policy board, or we're a working board, or we're the main board. You have lots of different terms. Do they mean the same thing, or what do they mean? And how does it affect your legal standing? And the answer is that with one exception, advisory, they don't really change anything. All they are are descriptors of the likely involvement that people on the board have with the day-to-day -day work of the organization. How involved they are, which in turn is a reflection on the staff that, that are there. But from a legal point of view, all of these, with the exception of advisory board, are boards of directors as far as the law is concerned. It makes no difference to your legal status. Same is true when it comes to a discussion on governance models. People love talking about governance models. And if you attended the first overview session, Sonia there suggested three, working, management, and policy. And I have no problem with those at all. Those are perfectly good definitions, perfectly good descriptions. But the reality is there are as many models as there are consultants out there. Again, it's trying to address the sort of way the organization operates. Does it make any real difference? Absolutely not. And nobody ever falls neatly within one of these models, because if we pause to think about it, organizations evolve. You start with everybody being all fired up with this idea around the kitchen sink, and then you develop and you start getting a little more formal about things and deciding you really ought to have a board, perhaps you incorporate. And then you grow and mature and you take on other challenges, fundraising, going out to actively recruit people to work on the board or to sit on committees and so on. And then you mature, you transform, you become the United Way, or unfortunately you discover that time is passing you by and the energy isn't there anymore and you wither and die. Ask yourself, where's your organization? Where would it fit on this spectrum? And the answers are almost undoubtedly, you don't fit neatly anywhere. You're showing some characteristics of one, but you've still got this issue here, but oh, here we're a little more advanced. And that's the reality when it comes back to governance models. 
it's very rare that you fit neatly into one definition. So while they're helpful, they're really just descriptives. And importantly, they make no difference to your legal status. So, board of directors, a group of people comprising the governing body of the corporation. Well, what do we mean by governing? That's a question in itself. There are as many definitions of governance as there are dictionaries out there. The one I particularly like is the one that talks about direction, control, and management. So we could say that this, the board of directors is a group of people comprising those responsible for the direction, control, and management. And that's not just my view. It's actually in the law. If you look at either act, you will see that the directors shall manage or supervise the management of the activities and affairs of the corporation, says the CNCA. And you'll find similar statement in the Ontario Corporations Act. As a board, the directors are responsible for the control, direction and management of the organization. So let's now look at the role of the board. And the first responsibility you have is following the rules. So what are the rules? It's a question, as I said at the beginning, that you ask any time you're asked to play a new game. And in this particular instance, you have two sources. One, the laws of the land, and most particularly the act under which you're incorporated. And secondly, what the legal profession likes to talk about as the constating documents, the articles and your bylaws. Let's look at these in turn. So the first thing are those that are externally imposed, which is the legislation. All sorts of legislation, let it be said. And these impose duties and responsibilities on the directors. And then you have those which are internally uh, imposed the articles and the bylaws, okay? The important thing to recognize is these you draft yourself. And if you don't like them, you can within reason change them. They're yours, okay? Let's look at these two sources, three levels in more detail. The first one, as we've pointed out, is the legislation, the incorporating act and, and other things. And these typically set a framework. Here's an example. Under the Corporations Act, it says the board of directors of a corporation shall have a fixed number, uh, not less than three. And that's true of the CNCA. It also mandates that you will have a minimum number. It doesn't set a maximum, just sets a minimum. Then what about the articles? And as I pointed out earlier on, these are particularly important because they set out the purposes and or objectives, the business that you're in. So here's an example. This organization uh, is very much into uh, running a food program and they do an excellent job uh, in that capacity. But this is an interesting example because it shows, illustrates another point. Firstly, that their target is persons of low income. So if you turn up and say, I have a mental health diagnosis, that's fine. But it doesn't permit them in the first instance to serve you because you have to be of low income. So that's a challenge for a start. Secondly, you know, they say by establishing, operating and maintaining shelters. Well, once upon a time, they did that. And then they discovered that the food program was so successful and they could more easily get volunteers for that. And there were all manner of challenges around running the shelters that they decided to get out of that business, as it were. And interestingly enough, they've never provided counseling services. So the point about the articles is they set the boundaries. They set out the things that you could do. You cannot do more than those but you can do less, very important. And then we have the third 
uh, category the bylaws, the rules of operation. Remember, these are set by yourself, by your own organization. You write them. And here we have two examples. In this instance, the association said, we're going to have 10 directors. Fair enough. Another example, it says the board will meet at least four times a year and with no big gaps between meetings. So these examples of bylaws setting the rules of operation. Now you should be aware that there are things called default bylaws under the CNCA. Again, look it up on their website. And these set out rules which will apply if you don't have them in your own bylaws. So for example, transferability of membership. This says that unless you write something different in your bylaws, you can't transfer your members membership. It will revert to the corporation. So you can't give it to your wife, give it to your best friend, give it to your son, pass it on in the family. The same is true, albeit it's not as clear, you have to dig a little further, under the Corporations Act. There are default conditions. Read the act, it will say that unless otherwise specified in the bylaws, the following apply. Okay? So be aware of these rules because they're very acceptable for the most part, but sometimes you want to do something different. And if you want to do something different, you have to be ex explicitly address those in your rules. So we have these two sources, the externally imposed, and around that, you're expected to have a general knowledge. Well, that's a slightly frightening thing because you may think of it, oh, it's just the incorporating act, we can get our heads around that. But the reality is that if you're in Ontario and employ a single person, then the list of legislation which imposes duties and responsibilities on a board of directors is substantial. Wow. So how do we deal with this? I'm going to suggest a couple of ways of doing it. The most obvious one is to have a governance committee. Set yourself up with a governance committee to advise the board. And let them subscribe to, uh, for example, the Canadian Charity Law site run by Bloomberg's. This is an organization, law firm, which publishes regular um, blogs on things affecting charity law and the status of charities and not-for-profits. Subscribe to this and, and have the governance committee give a report maybe every three months on things that have happened that we've read about which we think are relevant to our organization, if that's the case. There are other sites too, Carters, for example their charitylaw.ca site is a very useful site. So monitor these sites. You don't need to be a lawyer to do it, to read it. It's pretty simple and straightforward stuff that comes up. And if there's something that you think might be of importance, then talk to the people behind the, behind the blog and find out if it's relevant to you. But most importantly, there's a great little booklet I want to recommend. It's called The Duties and Responsibilities of Directors and Not-for-Profits. And this is published by the Canadian Association of, uh, Canadian Society of Association Executives. It's a little dated. It was, came out in, I think the last edition was in 2014. But it's a wonderful overview of your legal responsibilities and how they uh, cover off on things like environmental law, which is not unimportant to many. So equip every member of your board of directors with this little booklet. You will be getting a copy of these uh, slides and you can look up the reference then and note the details around the Canadian Society of Association Executives handbook. So to revert, externally you're expected to have a general knowledge, a briefing on the acts and legislation that affect you, the rules that again govern the way you do governance. And internally, 
you have these two things, the articles and the bylaws, of which you should have absolutely detailed knowledge. After all, the organization wrote them. If you're on the board, you're responsible for them. And if you don't like them, you can, as said before, change them. So you can't say, oh, I didn't know. Two sources, three levels, legislation, articles, bylaws. This is the framework of the rules under which you deal with issues of governance. So we've talked about following the rules. Let's talk about governance, because if we all, to take a simple example, ran out on the soccer field and stood still, we could be saying, oh, we're following our obligations. Look, we're not breaking any rules. No, but you're not playing the game either. You have to play the game under the rules. So let's look at what we, what playing the game looks like. What's the focus? And there are three things, five things I want to talk about. Most people have lists like this. You will find that we may use different words. Uh, we may have five things on our list or six things on our list, but they all boil down to much the same. The first role in playing the governance game is to establish the organization's vision and direction and to check that it's being followed. So this is rather like deciding that we will drive to Montreal and checking that the car is being driven to Montreal and not to Winnipeg. You don't have to drive the car yourself. You just have to make sure it's being driven in the right direction. You have to ensure the financial health. You have to make sure that the organization has money because without money, there's not a lot you can often do, okay? But equally, you have to manage the risk. So, do you have gas money, okay? And has the car been serviced? Or is it gonna break down the moment you get on the 401? Do you have, have you taken that money and converted it into appropriate resources? So when and if you do have a puncture, do you have a phone? Do you have a GPS to tell people so that you can call for help and tell them where you are? And by the way, is that phone charged? It's not sufficient that you have the technology or the resource. Has it been maintained? And then there's the issue of policies and systems so that you can actually direct and manage the operation. Do you have policies about uh, what sort of vehicle you can travel in? Uh, could we hire a stretch limo? Mm, don't think that would go down too well with the funders. Okay. Can we stop off and stay at a really nice inn in Kingston on our way to Montreal, as opposed to double up in a motel room somewhere? So what are your policies around things like this? And do you have the systems to make sure that they're followed and in place? The question of efficiencies, doing things the right way, and doing the right things, effectiveness, is something that funders get particularly interested in. And then lastly, your job, particularly as a board, is to assure that your stakeholding community Right, is on board with what you're doing. They don't necessarily have to agree with, with what you intend to do, but have they been consulted? Have they been asked for their opinion? Have you explained why? Or did you just change the program without telling anybody and just announce it? Okay. These are very important things. Consider, did you tell anyone you were going to put the canoe on the roof of the car? Did you tell anybody that, no, it's not your intention to drive directly up the 401 and be there by 3 o'clock this afternoon, but you were going to potter up Highway 2, take the scenic route, and perhaps stay somewhere on the way? So the idea of communicating with your stakeholders and explaining things is a very important one. So we have these five things, and I like to refer to them as the five M's. Management, money, means, methods and manner. Each of these, remember, has two aspects to it, direction and performance, 
funds and protection. You can see the list. In that context, in this context of responsibilities, how does having staff affect you? This is a very vexed issue for many organizations. So I want to touch on it briefly. The first style that I come across is where the board has hired an executive director and unfortunately tr treats that person very much as the office manager, answer the phones, uh, deal with the mail. This is impractical. The one person is in the office three or four days a week and the board turns up once a month. And then, dare I say, endeavors to micromanage to show who's in charge. Don't like the way you put the stamps on the envelope last week. I have to say, and with all due deference to the executive directors out there, the slightly worse situations you come across is where the ED endeavors to run the entire show and treats the board as somebody uh, to be dealt with like mushrooms, keep them in the dark and just feed them stuff when and if you feel like it. This unfortunately completely ignores the legal position where the board is responsible in the law. The best way, frankly the only way, is when the board and the ED see themselves as a partnership, where the board is focused primarily on the big picture stuff, Where's the organization going? Do we have the right policies in place? And the ED is responsible for operations and for advising and helping out the board. And let's face it, both parties will roll up their sleeves and help each other out when and if it becomes appropriate to do. So ask yourself, what's the relationship that we have between the board and the ED in our organization? Are we operating as this partnership? Do we understand that's what it should be about? Okay. If you do have questions, do send them in and we'll take note of them and stop every so often and try and I'll try and answer them. We did have one question earlier about clarifying the difference between the articles and the bylaws, and um, that was before you did so. Um, if you have any further questions about that, please feel free to type them into the question box. We're having a small technical difficulty here with not being able to type answers to the questions, but if um, you type them, we will take them up in the discussion here. Okay, let's talk about the director's role, because it's one thing to talk about the board as a collective group, but what about individuals? What about the individual director? How do their responsibilities uh, shape up? The legislation imposes, as we've seen, large numbers of responsibilities, but most specifically, it imposes a duty of care. Now, there are two standards that typically get associated with this, a subjective standard, which is what the Ontario corporations had for many years, and the objective standard, which is what the CNCA always had, and which the Ontario Corporations Act has now been changed. I did say it gets changed a lot, didn't I? It's been changed to be an objective standard too. What's the difference? With the subjective standard, the court would examine if there was some, some issue about whether you had exhibited a duty of care, it would say, well, what's your background? Are you the senior partner of a firm of accountants? Or are you somebody who had perhaps a high school education and you're now a retired music teacher with frankly very little business background? Is it reasonable that you should have understood the financial analysis that was presented or associated with this decision that appears now to have gone wrong? So you would have two members of the board judged by quite different standards. With an objective standard, which some, 
would argue is an easier standard, and I would not subscribe to that view, you are judged not on your personal background, but on the situation being considered. So let's consider you might, for example, be a housing agency, in which case you have very substantial real estate assets. You have perhaps a large staff of personal support workers involved. You might have a asset base or a turnover uh, operating budget running into several million dollars. The idea that any member of the board of a multi-million dollar corporation cannot read a financial statement, cannot follow a financial analysis, is completely unacceptable. So you are now judged under that objective standard by the situation, not by your personal background, but by the situation in which the decision is being made. And if it turns out that it's a multi-million dollar corporation, then clearly you're going to be held to a much higher standard than if you are a small charity barely getting by on 50,000 a year. We do have one question um, regarding the previous slide about the um, executive director and the board. What is the best approach to handling clashes or miscommunications between the ED and the board? <laughs> <laughs> um, send each party a good luck card. No, this is this is a this is a very real one, and it comes down to people not understanding what their roles are, not understanding. I think the legal position as to who is ultimately responsible, and and the realities of the situation, where you have somebody who is dealing with the day to day operations, the executive director. Okay. And, and feeling frustrated because they can see the potential and they can see the problems. And a board of directors whose responsibility under the law and whose accountability under the law says they're in charge, trying to deal with the big picture stuff. Inevitably, you will have differences of opinion. The trick, right from the get-go, is to have the conversations have the conversations, say to each other, we are partners in this, how else can you work it out? It happens in life. You quabble with your best friend. Doesn't mean to say they're not still your best friend. So my, my suggestion is recognize it. It's not that, yes, factually, the, the board is the employer of the executive director. That is absolutely true. But equally, they're very dependent upon that person to carry out their wishes and to implement the plan and, and so on. So work at it. I'll also add that as part of the Maximizing Governance Project, we will have two workshops um, later in the year, one on communications, which will take place on August 26th and one on conflict resolution taking place on September 30th. And further details about these will be available closer to the dates. Okay, we were talking about a duty of care. And I was uh, pointing out that both acts now have the same standard applied, an objective standard. So if we look at the legislation and the wording between the two acts is virtually identical, you'll see that every director is responsible when exercising their powers, discharging their duties, to act honestly and in good faith. And you'll often hear this talked about as the fiduciary duty that directors have. Well, it's incorporated under your duty of care. And with the best interests of the corporation, a duty of loyalty that you often hear discussed quite separately. Okay. And you have to do this in the way that is the best that a reasonable person would, would do in comparable circumstances. And that gets back to my observation about 
the comparable circumstance being, well, this is a multi-million dollar corporation and we hold you to a higher standard than some small uh, $50,000 organization focused on pet care or something else. Okay, Not that there's anything wrong with that. Some important work gets done in that area. But this is your duty of care. And every director should have this pinned to their bedpost and read it every night. I am very surprised at the number of organizations where you will find not only the, the directors, but the ED, the senior staff, unable to articulate exactly what is the vision of this organization, where is it going, what's our plan, where do we stand financially? Everybody on the board and senior staff members should be able to articulate that um, elevator speech, that brief moment that you get between floors to explain things to people in terms of what is the organization about? What's its current focus? Where do we stand financially? And what are the three great risks that we face, big challenges that we have right now? I don't know how you can say that you're exercising your duty of care, that you're really looking after the place, if you can't articulate those four things. Remember, this is, the board has a collective responsibility, but individual directors are equally accountable and ignorance is no defense. You have a couple of other things which are in, you'll find in the law. One is a duty of confidentiality. Obviously, as a board, you should have policies around this, what you discuss, what you put in board meetings, what you can talk about outside, and what stays in the room. But as an individual director, you also have a duty of confidentiality. And that, most particularly, is around the issue of collect that collective responsibility. You can't walk out of a board meeting and say, well, I disagreed with all of them. They don't know what they're talking about. There was arguments this and arguments that, and I think they were all wrong. When the board makes a decision, the board makes a decision, and you are part of the board. You can't go around bowing bad-mouthing uh, your fellow directors or indicating that you don't support it. Be aware of that. Be aware of that. You have another responsibility. You can't put your hand in the cookie jar. Okay? Conflict of interest. You have to be very careful that if there's any decisions being made that might benefit you, benefit your family or friends, then you have to fess up to it. And you have to say, I'm in a conflict of interest. And more than say that, you are now required, under both legislations, to have it written down. Put it in writing. Put it into the minutes of the board meeting. It's not sufficient to say, oh, I had a discussion with our treasurer, or I had a discussion with the chair, right? and we talked about it. No, get it in writing. And then... Recuse yourself. Step away from the decision. Okay? Perhaps even leave the room. So you have these duties. How do you fulfill your expectations? Well, the first order of business is know your stuff. What do I mean by that? Well, read your board manual. I hope you all have one. Be familiar with the rules especially the purposes and bylaws. These are things about which you should have specific knowledge. Okay? Meet with and become knowledgeable about key staff members, not just the ED. Visit the sharp end of the business. I'm often surprised that board members, for example, have never actually been and visited the needle exchange, or they've never visited that movement program on a Wednesday afternoon and ask people how they enjoy it or, or how they are feeling about the services that your organization provides. Okay? I'm not suggesting you go down there to interfere. I'm suggesting you go there to learn. Understand what staff do. 
and what the challenges are and what your customer base, to use commercial parlance, feel about your organization. Lastly, read the policies manual. Make sure you've got a solid policies manual around all manner of things from financial control to expense processing to confidentiality and so on. So know your stuff. The next thing is do the work. A lot of people are under the impression that attendance at board meetings, for example, is what life is about. No, that's not 25% of the effort that you'll need to put in to be a competent director. Okay? Your job is not just to attend the board meeting, but it's to do all the work outside. What's happening in the world outside? What are the needs of our customers, our clients? Okay? What are our competitors doing? What are those whom we cooperate with doing? Have I read? Have I researched? Have I asked questions? Have I gone looking? Am I able to walk into that board meeting with interesting ideas, solid questions to ask? Do the work. Thirdly, participate fully. Because it's not just a board meeting. There are committees to serve on. There are task forces to be members of. There are events to attend. All of those things you should feel obligated at some level to get involved with. It's not sufficient just to sit on the board. There are a wider set of things, and particularly in an environment where you don't have a big staff, participate fully. And then lastly, and perhaps behave appropriately, what does that mean? Well, let me explain. It's not enough just to attend the meeting, to be there for that seven o'clock board meeting. You should have prepared for it. You should have read all the reports ahead of time. You should have, quote, done the work. You should have got the good questions that you want to ask or understand and read uh, everything that's needed. So don't just turn up and then start thumbing through the stuff while you're in the room. Timeliness. If the meeting's at seven, don't turn up at five past seven, right? Be there and be ready, okay? It's how in North America you indicate you're more powerful than somebody else is by keeping them waiting. Don't keep people waiting, it's rude. I have a question. We may be having a problem with the audio at the moment. If participants, if you are able to hear us, please indicate so in the chat pane or in one of the questions. Do apologize for the technical difficulty. We are back. Thank you for your patience. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, so, Graham, a question for you. This may be more appropriate to take up after your presentation. So we will come back. Um, one question about incorporating nationally as well as provincially, and one question about conflict of interest. We will come back to those as soon as you're finished. Okay. I was talking about behaving appropriately and making the point that it's not enough just to attend meetings or events, you have to be prepared for them. I was making the point about timeliness. It's how in North America you indicate you're more powerful than somebody else. You keep them waiting. Don't keep people waiting. It's rude. Fitting in. This is business. Yes, by all means, if you're having a meeting with directors, okay, you want to ask people about the state of their health, whether they enjoyed their holiday, what's going on in the world. Do that while you're eating pizza ahead of the meeting. But when you get into the meeting, it's business. Let the focus be on business. It's how you're going to be judged 
by the, the world outside because running a not-for-profit or a charity, you are expected to behave in a business-like way. Again, I apologize. We may still be having a um, technical issue. I am going to restart the webinar software. Um, this should take maybe a, a minute or so, and we will get back into the, the webinar as soon as we can. Okay, can everyone hear us? Okay, if you can hear us, please click on the uh, hand icon, uh, raising your hand. Yes, okay, perfect, thank you. Um, Graham, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask that you repeat the material from this slide about appropriate behavior, um, communication differences, um, and fitting in. Okay. When it comes to fulfilling your responsibilities and being shown that you are endeavoring to fulfill your duty of care, one of the last points I made was about behaving appropriately. And that means doing things like coming to meetings properly prepared, coming to meetings on time, recognizing that the meeting is about business and social chit chat are not an unimportant thing in building relationship with your fellow directors or staff members or whatever else is an important thing, but do it outside the meeting. Many organizations have people from diverse backgrounds, different ethnicities, who, to whom Canadian is not their first language. And I, as clearly somebody with an English background, discovered when I came over here, the native language here is Canadian, it's not English, because words are used differently. I had the experience of being invited to a breakfast meeting next Friday, and I turned up three days later to discover that in Canada, next doesn't mean next as it does in English, it means the one after next, 10 days time. Three days would be this Friday as opposed to next Friday. So you learn these little things. Now, if you have a room full of people for whom Canadian is not their first language, then worry about things like that. Make sure that everybody does understand what's going on. Okay? A simple example uh, I have come across is when somebody from Japan nods it doesn't mean to say they agree with what I'm saying. It simply means I hear and understand what you say. I may violently disagree with it, but this is where the last point about politeness kicks in. In their culture, it may be quite rude to interrupt somebody or object to what the chairperson says, because that would be wrong. You might have a quiet word with them afterwards, but never in pu public would you suggest that they might be incorrect. So encourage your fellow board members, work at, at ensuring that language and politeness and issues of cultural background don't get in the way. Okay? Diversity is a very real strength to organizations, but it comes with its challenges. Okay, another concern I have, and this is a very real example. I have seen organizations where Everybody on the board has a title. This, to me, is quite wrong. It implies that individual directors have uh, an exclusive responsibility, where I've seen people say, oh, I'm in charge of programs. We have nothing to report. I won't go to the meeting. Wrong. You're all responsible for everything. 
I don't like the idea of vice president and this chain where the third vice president in a year's time becomes the second vice president, who some years after that becomes the vice president and ultimately becomes the president or chair. How do you know what the organization is going to want in six years or eight years time? How do you know if that person is actually going to still be living in Ontario? And what about that person, that bright person who's handling communications at the moment? Why shouldn't they have the opportunity to become the president or the chair in the future? I don't think you need this sort of thing. You have a collective responsibility as a board and titles get in the way. I would get rid of them all. There are three to me which are valid. President, secretary, treasurer. Why? Because those are the titles given to the officers of the corporation. And in most instances, in not-for-profits and for charities, those officer positions are given to members of the board. So you are a director and also a president or director and also secretary. And the difference between directors and officers are that directors are elected by members they're the people accountable, as we've seen, for running the corporation. They're responsible for governance. And if you're in a charity, you can't get paid for it. Whereas the officers are rather like the management team that a for-profit company might have. Uh, they should be appointed by the board, though I have seen organizations where the members elect officers. I think that's a very bad practice. Uh, much better to appoint a director who has been examined by his peers or her peers, right? They've seen that person in action. They know that they are competent. Whereas if you have them elected by members, you may end up electing somebody who is a single cause advocate and frankly knows very little about the rest of the organization. I have even seen examples where people were elected presidents of the organization and didn't know that the organization had staff when it had lots of staff. I mean, how can this person be suddenly put in charge? So, officers appointed by the board, they're there to facilitate the management of the corporation. They're the thing that government typically asks for, who's the president, who's the secretary, who's the treasurer, and commonly, they are a director. So we have these three titles, they represent the organization, record the meetings, do such things, officers. But collective responsibility is key for the board. You may absolutely give individual directors responsibility for certain aspects of things, like liaising with staff, uh, looking after the technology, chairing the finance committee, but you don't have to give them a title. They're all directors, collective responsibility. Now, back to our duty of care and how do you uh, exhibit this, we've gone over some points. So you can say, I've shown proper diligence, but you have one other defense in law, and that's what's called a good faith defense, when you can rely on particular documents or statements uh, from people. Um, examples here, here on, the, on the slide. You don't have to, if your accountants say these are the, the numbers, you don't have to say, oh, I better check them myself. You can rely on that document as a good faith. We have a question. We've lost audio again. Okay. And we're back. Again, my apologies. Okay. Indemnities and insurance were being discussed. I said you have a defense that you have been properly diligent and you're allowed to rely on particular examples. Over and above that, you should also have insurance. 
make sure that the corporation is carrying director's and officer's liability insurance. You really don't want to be on a board if it's not carrying director's and officer's liability insurance. And that is different from your standard errors and omissions insurance. Organizations will very often have errors and omissions uh, insurance to guard against mistakes that are made by staff members about this or that or whatever else, okay? Common policies. But directors and off officers liability insurance is key in as much as it protects you from the effects of business decisions being made. Now, it's directors and officers, which leads me to another little point. I'm a strong advocate for making your executive director an officer of the corporation, not a board member. They will be expected to attend as an invitee board members. But make sure they're an officer of the corporation. It facilitates administration, and it means that they would be covered by your directors and officers insurance. Just to recap, because the sound dropped out again, um, Graham is advocating that your um, executive director be an officer of the corporation. Thank you. And then make sure in your bylaws where you say, we're not going to pay our officers, you put an exemption in, in that says, other than an executive director. I think executive directors out there will pay close attention to that. They do want to make sure they get paid for their job. Okay, be aware there is no protection if you are willfully negligent. It doesn't matter if you have insurance, no insurance company will pay out if you are willfully negligent. You didn't even bother to read the articles. You weren't aware of what was written in the articles. You signed a contract as, as a board director, for example, okay, which you were not entitled to sign. Uh, the other thing to be aware of, and this affects any charity, whether they're under the CNCA or under the Ontario Corporations Act, if you are based in Ontario, you must conform to the Charities Accounting Act. And that requires that before you purchase insurance, you have done an appropriate risk analysis. Check that out. And I would advocate that spend five minutes in a board meeting to, to genuinely do the work and think through these things. And it may take uh, more than a five minute discussion. It may take substantial work, but go do the analysis and have it minuted, have it minuted that you have considered the risks before you go off and buy that insurance policy because you are required to consider the risks under the Charities Accounting Act. Okay, so we've talked about the board's role in general, the legislative environment, and how you, as a director, for example, can guard against questions of, of have you carried out your duty of care properly. Let's talk about some challenges, just by way of a summary and illustration. Because I, I'd like, if I can, to draw on the experience uh, I've, um, that I've had over the last uh, several years in helping organizations to help you avoid some of these problems. The top problem that I see, the one that's most common and the one that's most damaging, is a failure to comply. And what that means is ignorance of the rules, where organizations are unaware of the rules. They're unaware of what is written in their uh, articles, which sets out the purpose. And so, and this is uh, an example very close to home, uh, MAS, Management Advisory Service that I work for, right? um, increasingly in this day and age, gets asked by organizations across the country for help. In these days of video conferencing and electronic documents, it's not difficult to help somebody anywhere. But it turned out that our rules, and we were aware of it, said, oh no, you are designed to provide services to people within the province. 
So we had to change them to allow us to provide services across the country. A lot of organizations will find that they haven't seen their rules, they haven't gone back and revisited the, these issues, and they're now doing things which they're, strictly speaking, not allowed to do. Another reason this happens is what I call mission drift, chasing the money. All organizations are always looking for new sources of revenue. And over time, what happens is a project comes up. Somebody suggests that this piece of work could be done and there are, there's revenue attached to it. And so organizations pursue things, chasing the money, which they're actually not allowed to do with uh, all manner of legal consequences. And the third thing is what I call lack of due process. They don't know that, and they don't certainly follow the rules because they are unaware of the rules, and therefore they do things. Rewrite their bylaws. And they rewrite their bylaws without consulting a charity lawyer, as a result of which they decide I'm going to change the number of directors we have from 10 to 8, or I'm going to change the quorum requirements, things like that. Well, they rewrite a bylaw and they get it passed, and it says bylaw number so and so says that the directors will be 8 in number with a quorum of 5. The problem is in rewriting it well-intentioned, but done by amateurs with no legal supervision, they didn't retract, cancel, annul the earlier bylaw section. And so you now have two bylaws in effect. One says we need 10 directors, and one says that we need eight directors, which applies. So make sure that you understand the rules and if there's one thing i really encourage people to do today at the end of this workshop is go back to their organization and pull out their articles find them read them pull out their bylaws and check for things like that did we actually ever cancel the earlier bylaws that these are supposed to replace the second thing is a, just a genuine lack of understanding, misplaced reliance on others. Oh, we have a lawyer on the board, so the lawyer will keep us out of legal trouble. Well, would you ask a foot surgeon to deal with your leukemia, or would you ask your leukemia specialist to do an operation on your brain? I think not. But yet these people are both doctors. So why is it that we treat lawyers as if they're quite capable and knowledgeable about all manner of law. They're not. They're all specialists. And what's important is that any lawyer that you rely on has a background in charity law, not in international trade, in charity law. There's misplaced belief that you can avoid responsibility. I've seen organizations which come up with an executive committee because there's a large board, so they have an executive committee. Should we say a 15 or 18 person board, an executive committee of six, and that basically they expect to run the place. And half the board members therefore don't even attend board meetings or bother about things at all. It has not relieved them of responsibility they are still in law, absolutely responsible and accountable. Be aware of that. And then, unfortunately, there's the last point here, misplaced trust in people. People who work for not-for-profits, people who work for charities, are good people. They want to do good. They therefore look for goodness in others, and they expect goodness in others, and they trust the goodness in others. Unfortunately, if you look at the statistics, 7% of charity monies typically get lost through fraud. It is an unfortunate statistic, but it's there, which means that some of those long-serving employees, some of the directors, may be doing things 
which are frankly criminal. There is no reason not to have the proper controls in place over your financial systems and so on. You must consider the idea that when everything goes wrong, if anything goes wrong, and the Toronto Star puts it on the front page, page, that you feel comfortable in saying, yes, I know it went wrong, but we have done everything reasonable to control that. Not that, oh, well, um, I'm sorry, never thought of that. You've never heard of fraud? You've never heard of people stealing from petty cash? Misplaced trust in people. And the third thing are poor recruitment practices. And this is, this is a, a, again, a very serious issue. There is, I think, later a session on uh, boards and board evaluation. And what you see happening is people joining boards for personal reasons. Uh, they have an agenda. If I'm on the board, then maybe little Johnny will get to play on this team because we're a sports association. Um, we are an organization dealing with um, drugs for rare medicines. And frankly, I'm only interested in one particular drug for one relative of mine, and I don't care about the others, but I go on the board because I think there's a chance I might be able to do something around that. Personal agendas, quite wrong. You have people that get recruited to boards who have a lack of commitment. Okay? Don't tell me I've got to do work I'm a volunteer, okay? Not right. You have, now you may have been recruited on completely false basis. You were told when someone invited you to join a board and you said, what's involved? Oh, it's a couple of hours on a Monday night occasionally and there's free pizza. Well, as we've seen, it isn't a couple of hours on a Monday night occasionally. It's a lot of work and a lot of responsibility. Okay? So lack of commitment. Lack of necessary competences. The board needs to have a set of skills appropriate to running the business. So they need finance people, yes, but what about a technology person? What about a social media person? What about somebody who understands human relations? What about somebody who is very familiar with the sphere in which you operate, um, housing? Have you got somebody who understands property management on the board? You haven't been recruiting around necessary competences. What's been happening is that people have, we need a board member, I know somebody, and they've invited a friend along. Not the right approach. We should be consciously recruiting board members just as you would uh, consciously recruit staff members because they have a particular competency, skill set, and appropriate experience. And tied into this is something which comes back to bylaws. We don't put term limits on directors. And so you see the same people on the board year after year. This is not good. You need to renew the organization. Otherwise, you get into groupthink. You've all been there together. You all understand everybody's point of view. And it becomes a very unattractive proposition for that young 30-year-old keen to help to join this crowd that's been working together, or not working together, but meeting together for the last 15 years. So make sure you deal with issues like succession planning. Okay, so the big three challenges that, that I, I see. There are undoubtedly major challenges for directors and for senior staff when it comes to legal roles and responsibilities. It's very important that you understand just what those are and understand the consequences of not meeting your role and responsibility. But at the same time, organizations such as the ones you represent are there fundamentally to do good. They're 
play an increasingly important role in civic society. And as a director, as a key staff member of such an organization, your ability to do good is tremendous if you do the job properly. As a director of such an organization, you've been put by the membership in a privileged position to help. Remember that, carry out your roles and responsibilities, and always remember, as Worf in Star Trek The Next Generation said, if you'll pardon me and my rather old-fashioned view of the world, it is an honor to serve. Thank you. Okay, that was Graham Boyce from Management Advisory Service. Graham, thank you very much for a very enlightening presentation about legal roles and responsibilities for board members of not-for-profit organizations. We'd like to take up some questions now. Uh, the first is uh, from Peter Chu asking, what well, if our organization is currently incorporated in Ontario, what is the process of transitioning to incorporating federally? And is an organization allowed to be incorporated under both um, provincial and federal law? Well, the quick answer is no, you can't be incorporated under both. You sh you've got to choose. But there is nothing stopping you uh, from transitioning. If you say oh, we're under the Ontario legislation, but we'd like to go under the federal legislation, you can apply to the feds for continuance. Check it out on, on the net. It's a very simple process. Even the Ontario government website will tell you how to transition uh, to the feds. There's a lot of form filling involved, um, but it's not a difficult thing to do. I would say this, though. When you do it, make sure you have the proper legal advice from a charity lawyer to make sure that you get it done properly. Okay, thank you. Next question from Rania Yunus. Is there any conflict of interest where a board member is in a similar social circle as an organization's staff? Can a board member have a social connection to staff? I don't see why not. Um, I think you have to be careful about that uh, when it comes to, um, for example, uh, personnel reviews or issues like that, where you have uh, you have an interest in that and that person. Um, but many of the decisions you're making as a corporation do not do not uh, directly impact staff. But any time there's a sense that this decision. Might it might change roles of of uh, the staff member, or you're discussing salary levels or uh, issues like that? Then clearly you should recuse yourself as a director. It sounds quite reasonable. Thank you. A question from Oz Zakis. Um, I hope I'm getting the pronunciation correct. Um, and I think that you may have already answered this. Does director's insurance bulletproof the board? No. It never bulletproofs the board. That's why the legal profession exists, <laughs> because there will always be a lawyer out there who will argue one way or the other. Uh, but it does provide um, a significant protection. But remember, uh, there is no protection if you are willfully negligent, if you have not done your homework, if you have not followed your own rules for example, uh, then you, I'm afraid to say, uh, have no protection from the law or courtesy of insurance policies. But I do absolutely advocate having such insurance. I would not go on a board personally uh, in an environment in which that such policy did not exist. Okay, thank you. Now, a couple of questions about making the ED an officer mm -hmm. of the corporation. Um, if the ED is an officer, um, would the ED be an ex officio director, or is that different? That's quite different, okay, and absolutely not. You, you can't put the ED on the board. 
The ED is an employee of the corporation. And you can imagine the situation where if they were on the board, they would then be employing themselves and be in a, in a constant state of uh, conflict because every decision the organization made typically involves money, which means there's less money to pay the ED, <laughs> to take the simple case, case in point. So no, you can't employ yourself. So uh, EDs are officers of the corporation, right? They are not to be made a director of the corporation. Okay, and a related question from Anne. How do you make your ED an officer of the corporation? Does that mean they have a vote at board meetings? Absolutely not. They're not a member of the board. So therefore, they have no vote at a board meeting. It's not to say the, bo the board will not turn to that invited to a board meeting, executive director, and say, what's your view? And, and be m conceivably much influenced by that view. But they don't have a vote because they're not a member of the board and they should not be a member of the board. They should, as part of their role and responsibility, be invited to attend, be expected to attend be board meetings on, on a regular basis. Uh, that's a different issue though. So how do they become officers? They become an officer because in your bylaws you say, should the board choose to appoint an executive recruit and appoint an executive director, that person will be designated as an officer of the corporation. And when in your bylaws you say, we expect our officers to serve without remuneration, just as directors serve without remuneration, if you're a charity, or you say, with the exception of the executive director, if appointed. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, from Anne, what do you do if your bylaws are silent about how they are to be changed and no process is identified? Um, your bylaws typically will not indicate uh, the, the process. The process, uh, anytime bylaws or articles are silent, things revert to the act. So you would have to go back to the legislation. And the legislation will tell you, both cases, that the board has the power to rewrite uh, bylaws with certain clear exceptions. The board has the power to rewrite bylaws. And these bylaws will typically come into effect immediately, but they will often be subject to ratification acceptance by the membership at the next membership meeting. So you can change, for example, the, the frequency with which the board meets or something like that. You can change, change uh, such a, a bylaw, okay? Um, and that's typically no problem at all. And it, it comes into effect now and will get ratified, accepted by the membership or not. They can reject it. And if they reject it at the, at the next meeting, forget about it. That change is not accepted. But there are some things which do not come into effect. Even if the board says, we want to change this, they do not come into effect until there has been a special resolution of the membership, which means not a 50% plus one, but a, a higher uh, level of, of um, those entitled to vote uh, have of, in the membership have done. And those are typically things such as they affect members' rights. Okay. Um, Any time that you're doing things which affects the power of the membership to influence things, uh, you will find, and, and they're listed. They're listed very, very clearly on within the legislation. The things that you cannot do um, by uh, simply board resolution alone. Okay. Thank you. We've got three more questions. Uh, two of them are about conflict. Uh, one from Alex, he says, uh, or she says, uh, wonderful presentation. Perhaps this is a complicated question, but would love to hear thoughts. Where a director is in conflict with their board member peers and initiates a lawsuit against the organization, does that director remain a director or has their duty of loyalty or fiduciary duty to the organization been breached? Is this an inherent conflict of interest? 
Hmm, that's a that's an <laughs> in, interesting one. Um, I'm going to avoid answering that uh, and deal with it in a different way. Uh, I'm going to suggest that if you have any sense that such a situation might arise, and and I know we're all nice people and we all get on together, but sometimes things go wrong. Uh, you should have in your bylaws a dispute resolution mechanism. And typically your dispute resolution mechanism will speak to such issues. Okay, And the first thing it will say is you're not allowed to bring a lawsuit. Uh, you have to go to mediation or arbitration or otherwise. I suspect that if a director is, is also uh, in conflict uh, with um, the fellow board members and it has got to the point where there's litigation flying around, they won't be attending board meetings and uh, you might well as your remaining directors put a resolution to the membership to have the members remove that person as a director of the corporation. There are a number of mechanisms that could be employed. I am not a litigation expert, I'm not a practicing lawyer. Uh, I would suggest consult your charity lawyer uh, around such matters. But I can see, perceive there would be mechanisms that you might want to have uh, properly addressed in your bylaws in the first insti in instance, one of which would be to say, we have a dispute resolution mechanism which talks about how you handle such situations. Okay, thank you. Um, the... There was one more question that just came in from Gina about the um, receiving the slides from the webinar after the event via email. Um, we had not planned to send them by email. However, there is a section in your GoToWebinar software called Handouts. They are available for download there. Um, should you not be able to download them, please email me. E Mooney, M O O N E Y, at ocasi.org, and I will send you a copy. Next question about conflict from Tracy, and we're getting um, a little bit over time, so we'll try to uh, wrap this up. But what if you have an ED that does not follow direction very well and becomes very difficult to work with? What is the board's position on looking at options? This is a question of employment contract. What is this? Is this is a subject of employment law? Um, if you uh, and I would just leave it. I'd leave my answer to that. This is a matter of employment law. What's your employment contract? Uh, if you have an, uh, an uh, employee of the corporation who is not uh, fulfilling, taking responsibility for things in the appropriate way, is not following direction. Uh, they're no different from any other staff member or employee who's not um, taking proper instruction. Okay. And that, that will be true whether you're serving coffee in a um, Starbucks or you're a senior executive of a major corporation. Look at your employment contract. It's a matter of employment law. Okay. Thank you. And the last question for today is about... Um, is also from Rania about best practices to recruit and onboard boards of directors. Any uh, links or resources for tools and material that you can direct us to? Well, the first one is an upcoming workshop. <laughs> 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 no, that's going to, I think, very much address the issue of, of uh, those things. But I do think that uh, it's beholden on corporation to organizations uh, to fully prepare potential board members around what the respons their responsibilities are, to give them uh, a clear understanding of what governance responsibilities are, to make very clear what the organization is about, to explain their articles, to go over their bylaws, and to be honest about what the time commitment is. It's not two hours on a Monday night with free pizza occasionally. Right. 
Okay, and that brings us to a close for uh, today's webinar. Again, many, many thanks to Graham Boyce and to Bill Sparks, also from Management Advisory Service, who has been coordinating their involvement with this project. After you, the, um, you leave the webinar, you will be asked to complete a survey. The answers for this survey will be shared with Social Planning Toronto, which is our evaluation partner for this project. This is the first time that this governance training project has been run, and we are very eager for your feedback, and we do take it quite seriously. Again, I do apologize for the, um, the dropouts of the audio, and um, the slide deck is available as um, a downloadable handout. Thank you very much. And we will be holding our next in-person workshop on financial management on Monday, April 29th, 7 to 9 p.m. And it is the location is Metro Hall, downtown Toronto, 55 John Street, in room 309. Thanks again. My name is Emily Mooney, and I hope that we will see you at future Maximizing Governance events and webinars. Thank you.